So we now have a plenary session to discuss the controversial title, Has the Media Turned Its Back on Human Rights? We're very... <laughs> so it's good to hear you're open-minded for this discussion. <laughs> We're very pleased uh, with the people that we have joining us today to contribute to this discussion and uh, we're also very much looking forward to the questions from the audience later on in the session. So what I'm going to do is introduce everybody at once and then we've, we've got all of that done so that then we can just get on with the bones of the session. So Jeff Waters, who's sitting in the middle, Jeff is going to be the chair of this session. Um, Jeff is the senior journalist in Victoria for ABC News. He was Australia's first video journalist and has reported news and current affairs for Australian and international news organisations from 25 countries, largely on human rights, social justice and developing world issues. His successful first book, which I know many of you in the room have read, Gone for a Song, A Death in Custody on Palm Island, is a forensic review of policing and governance issues in the wake of the death on Palm Island in 2004. So Jeff will be... Um, chairing and moderating this session, but I'll just introduce the other speakers. Then we also have Sophie Black, just immediately here on my left, who is a writer, a journalist and editor of the online news service Crikey. Sophie has written on subjects such as immigration, climate change, the media, the publishing and advertising industries, Indigenous affairs, US and federal politics, and prior to Crikey, Sophie was the deputy editor of the weekly magazine The Reader. We will next have Mark Dodd, who's a Defence and Foreign Affairs writer for The Australian. Defence and Foreign Affairs writer for The Australian. Mark has started his career in journalism with the Fremantle Gazette in Western Australia, went on to serve as the Bureau Chief for Reuters in Cambodia, served as a correspondent and freelancer, and I, I joked in conversation before that for a couple of um, the people that we have on the panel, it's a list of countries that you wouldn't want to travel to on your holidays. Uh, but worked in Burundi, Rwanda, Somalia, Uganda, Tanzania, Congo, Jakarta. Worked for the Sydney Morning Herald and the Age in Dili, covering the lead up to and aftermath of the UN sponsored vote for independence, for which he received a Group Walkley Award. Next speaker is Michael Ware, which some of you have already had the pleasure of hearing Michael speak. Michael is a former correspondent for Time Magazine and CNN. He brings a unique personal perspective from the battlefields of the war on terror. Uh, he spent years in Afghanistan and Iraq and his insights into the Iraqi perspective of the war based on innumerable high-risk encounters with the insurgent foot soldiers themselves were closely followed by members of the US military corps. Michael featured in an acclaimed episode of Australian Story and is currently working on a feature-length documentary. And then finally we have Hugh Remington, Channel 10's national political reporter. And Hugh has covered wars, upheavals, famine, disasters and fortunately occasional good news from dozens of countries. Seen firsthand almost every major international cataclysm of our time, whether in Afghanistan, Iraq, Somalia, Uganda, Sudan, you get the feeling. He's currently in uh, semi-retirement from trouble as a political editor for the 10 Network, living a placid life in Canberra with a fourth child due in December. And he told me not to say this, but this is kind of the most interesting bit, so I like it. Among his interests, Hugh helped launch and briefly head an NGO last year to improve livestock health in South Sudan, which is something that people probably didn't know. But more importantly, he's been a member supporter or volunteer of Amnesty since his teens. So we're very pleased to have him here. So I'll hand over to Jeff to take you through the session. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, they've asked me to write a little introduction, so here I go. Um, it's with a great deal of pleasure that I uh, sit today in my hometown speaking freely about human rights issues. When I left Queensland for Canberra back in the days of Joe Bielke petersons government, things were a lot different here. For a start, technically speaking, my immediate family couldn't walk down the street together without a permit. <laughs> we constituted an illegal street march. <laughs> I fled a state in which a vote in the city was worth about a third of one in the country where abortion clinics were routinely raided, Aboriginal people were routinely mistreated, and where it was illegal to serve alcohol to anyone in a same-sex relationship. And um, on the Aboriginal treatment in this state, I invite any visitors to Brisbane to walk a couple of blocks later today up to the City Hall and have a look at the tympanum, the triangular relief sculpture above the entrance, which portrays, and it's only about 80 years old, which portrays the... Uh, white conquest, the European conquest of these lands, 
and on the left hand side you'll see a dead indigenous man um, in plain view above the city's main square. Uh, during this time, the Bjorki Peterson years, over at the University of Queensland, the student newspaper was censored and the condom vending machines were ripped off the walls by police. I'm sure a gathering like this one would not have been welcomed. Much of that have cha has changed here, of course, though you might like to speak to, uh, to people in Queensland's Indigenous communities about mistreatment, particularly those living on Palm Island, as we've already heard here. But um, our nation has changed in that time as well and not necessarily for the better. Back then, the right to higher education was universal and free. Foreign trained general practitioners could live anywhere they wanted to. And of course, um, this country, uh, and particularly the state, and Western Australia as well, uh, is famous for mandating where certain uh, government employees live, which of course can't happen anywhere where there's a Human Rights Act. Um, the media was allowed to discuss any case of terrorism Aboriginal people in the Northern Territory could manage their own money. And of course, asylum seekers arriving by boat weren't compulsorily imprisoned. Can these changes at least in part be blamed on the media? Has the media turned its back on human rights? Of course, the portrayal in Australia of human rights issues abroad, or indeed the lack thereof, is another contentious issue. Why, for instance, was there so little coverage in Australia of the recent humanitarian crisis in the Ivory Coast following last year's election? And how many Australians know that the United Nations declared an acute food crisis in that country just a few days ago? The recent and remarkable flooding crisis in Pakistan su uh, uh, suffered a similar fate in the Australian media. As the waters rise again there, as we meet here now, and as the same displaced people face another season of destruction, there's even less coverage than last year. And what of the extraordinary blinkered view we have of what's going on in Indonesia's Papua, West Papua and Maluku provinces, which are so close but so far from our gaze. In the media, bare and bloody conflict seems to trump other human rights concerns like gender-based violence or sexuality issues. And will the splintering of the traditional media models and the subsequent slashing of travel budgets make matters worse? And well, that's what we're here to discuss. So the, uh, what we'll do now is uh, I'll ask each of the other panel members to address the topic briefly <coughs> and then we'll open it up for a big long Q&A session. I'll do my best Tony Jones impersonation and you can all swear as much as you like. <laughs> so, who do we start with? Sophie, please. Me. Okay, well, as editor of Crikey, uh, Australia's biggest independent online news service, I thought I'd look at this question from a an online media perspective, because uh, we do tend to get a bad rap in this area and that's not entirely unjustified. For example, I, I just checked the sort of top most, uh, the five most popular stories on the Korea Mail website on my way in here, and I'll read three of the headlines. Boys suffer sex horror for throwing stone, minister approves crackdown on undies, and transsexuals win despite sex organs. I don't know what any of those headlines mean, but you get the idea. Similarly, this week, the Huffington Post, that bastion of online journalism, supposedly announced a number of new hubs or niche sites under their banner. And I'll read out a couple of the names. We've got HuffPost Canada, HuffPost Canada Living, HuffPost Celebrity, HuffPost Culture, HuffPost High School, HuffPost Parents, HuffPost Small Business uh, and uh, HuffPost uh, Tech. So again, not especially big on the human rights coverage there. So very broadly, human rights coverage in, in online uh, media, mainstream media outlets is looking pretty grim. And that is partly to do with the industry being in a, in a state of flux. And as newspapers funding dries up and other media outlets funding dries up and migrates online, uh, there is a loss of resources and funding and time. So what does this mean? Well, there was a report published in November last year by UK's Media Standards Trust called Shrinking World, and that examined the coverage of foreign affairs in The Guardian, The Telegraph, The Mirror and The Mail each decade since 1979. 
Now, the study found that compared to 30 years ago, there are now 39% fewer international stories. International news fell from 20% to 11% of stories over the same period. And at the same time, focus has shifted predictably towards stories which are essentially extensions of UK politics or involving celebrities. So here's a little example. Of the two stories on India that the Mirror covered during the first three months of 2010, one was on the arrest of British plane spotters on suspicion of spying, and the other was on Lindsay Lohan's life-changing visit to the country. So, but most significant is the decline of on-the-ground foreign reporting, with fewer professional foreign correspondents than ever. Now, this is, remember, this is from a UK perspective, but this is mirrored across the world. So the number of foreign reporters has declined for nearly all UK newspapers in the past 30 years, this study found. We all know a foreign bureau is expensive, as is sending a lone journalist there. And so that combined with the rise of the 24-hour news cycle and coupled with this feeling amongst news editors that there's simply not a demand for that kind of journalism means that we're seeing a marked decrease in this kind of coverage. I think it was neatly summed up by a cartoon in the Times uh, recently by Peter Brooks. Uh, and it was the, the cartoon was labelled Priorities and it depicted three starving children in East Africa holding empty bowls with swollen bellies. And one of the children said, I've had a belly full of phone hacking. Now this coincided with all of the blanket coverage around News International's uh, scandal around the news of the world phone hacking. And I think there was uh, a statement put out by several NGOs in the midst of this saying, please, you know, this is an phone hacking is an important story, but there's an even bigger story going on, pleading for more coverage of the famine. But then again, there's another side to this coin. To this coin. So uh, for months, Tunisians were tweeting about the unrest that was going on there and, and asking where BBC, the BBC or CNN were, were on this issue. Uh, but at the same time, we were seeing this upswell in social media. Now, I interviewed Salil Shetty yesterday on the role of social media and revolutions and how that has impacted on mainstream media's coverage. And this is the exciting aspect of online media. This, this, sh this is where the potential lies. We're seeing more citizen journalism, we're seeing handheld uh, mobile devices and the use of them really impacting on, on uh, what we see on the ground in real time. So we also need to bear in mind that the subsequent media, there was a, uh, we're also battling media blackouts such as the media blackout in Iran. We haven't seen this sort of uh, use of social media play out to such an extent in countries like China which has pretty much successfully cracked down on this kind of thing. So ultimately there is no substitu substitute for good on the ground reporting. We need both of these things. And that's where we come back to the funding of journalism. Public broadcasters are more important than ever. Uh, there's been some controversy around, around the adequate resourcing of ABC News 24. Uh, in January, the BBC announced that uh, 650 jobs from its world service would be cut. That's about 25% of the total workforce. So we need to look at the kind of impacts of that sort of thing. But there are some good news stories as well. So coming out of this argument around the funding of journalism, we're, we're seeing a lot of, uh, especially in America, America's leading the way in terms of philanthropy and the public funding of journalism outlets. We saw, for example, ProPublica, which is a very large investigative journalism unit that is funded uh, from a combination of, of philanthropy and public funding. Wa they won the first Pulitzer Prize for a non-print story uh, in the last six months. So, and they are going from strength to strength. Uh, in terms of Crikey, uh, we're a tiny, tiny little outlet. We have seven journalists sitting around a desk. We never get to leave our desk. Uh, our human rights coverage relies on people, contacts that we have on the ground that we chase down. We get them to write about what they're seeing. For example, we've had uh, a few correspondents write from the Dadaab refugee camp for us recently. 
Uh, it also relies on really committed journalists who clearly aren't in it for the money. For example, we ran a 10-week series by a freelance journalist called Inga Ting on the 20th anniversary of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody. Uh, an incredibly forensic piece of analysis that ran over 10 weeks. Now, we we can't afford to pay much money for this kind of thing, but Inga was clearly dedicated to the cause and the issue, and as a result, we were able to run a, a, a pretty stunning investigation. Uh, we've also looked at collaborating with universities more for this kind of coverage. Most recently, we ran an investigation in conjunction with uh, UTS in Sydney, with the Australia Cent Australian Centre for Independent Journalism on mental health and public housing in New South Wales. So these are the kinds of ways that we are trying to address our inadequate resources uh, in order to uh, boost our coverage of, of human rights issues. So there are some good stories, but unless we can find a more sustainable way of funding this kind of journalism, the outlook is pretty grim. I think um, what you're saying about uh, resourcing uh, is very important, uh, particularly for international journalism. Mm. But um, perhaps we can pick up later on on the effects that has domestically, mm. if if any, you know. So now we'll turn um, to Mark Dodd from the Australian. Thank you. But well, as Sophie identified, these are incredibly challenging times for broadsheet newspapers, uh, diminishing revenue from advertising and. Uh, having to come to terms now with the full implications of the 24-hour news cycle. Um, compared to 10, 15 years ago, our travel budgets have been slashed. Um, foreign coverage is, is diminishing, much more reliance now on alliances, uh, at least within the news network. Um, uh, newspapers are picking up perhaps uh, stories from the London Times um, rather than using our own, our own people. Um, does it mean that we've forsaken human rights? No, not at all. It, it makes it uh, a, a lot more challenging. Um, and perhaps I can just um, share with you a, a few experiences as to why I think um, uh, we, ha we have not uh, forsaken human rights. And I think the casualty toll of journalists alone among in the last decade, decade and a half, surely stands as testimony that um, we're fully and totally committed to reporting. Um, we just need the budget. Um, in, in Cambodia, when, uh, when I was working in, in Cambodia, there was a, a US in trade embargo on. And I think, uh, along with uh, my colleagues, uh, we were able to raise attention not just to the fact that the Khmer Rouge were um, still very busy in, in, the, in the northwest of the country, but also the, the absolutely inequitable impact that it was having on hospitals. And raising raising the awareness that um, it was just the, the ordinary people, the ordinary Khmer that uh, these uh, iniquitous embargoes were, were affecting. And, and in, the, in the lead up to the UN election, um, there was a, um, we reported on the uh, human rights abuses and the, in the intimidation of um, uh, government officials who wanted to stay in power. And uh, there was a, a huge toll wrought by the the Cambodian journalists who are so proud to be for the first time reporting um, about uh, developments in their country and, and participating in, in a free election. Um, in, um, in Jakarta, in the post Sahato uh, uh, days in 1998, May 1998, it was Indonesian journalists who were, were very active and, and without, without their help and the help of the uh, our interpreters and uh, translators helping identify the pogrom against the Chinese in, in North, North Jakarta. Um, again, it was journalists who reported uh, fiercely, uh, you know, fearlessly and, and brought the attention to the world of what was happening in the Maluku's when the, um, the, is, you know, the Muslim communities and the Christian communities went to war in 19, uh, 1999, in January of that year. And then, and then came the, the Hadid announcement of uh, East Timor and, and again, the, um, Journalists such as John Martinkus, who'd been in um, in East Timor previous to 1999, I don't always agree with everything that John had written, but certainly was instrumental in keeping keeping the focus on East Timor. And then um, with uh, with more journalists now covering the build up to the UN uh, broken election, the famous plebiscite. There was uh, the, the stories of intimidation, the massacres, the, the, the 
killings, the, the, the insidious linkage between the TNI and the, and the militia proxies who are planning and doing so much to disrupt the poll. I think journalists again there, um, Indonesian journalists as well, which we often tend to overlook. Remember, Agus Muliwan was, was killed there along with uh, Sandra Turns. So uh, I think we, we, do, we do cover um, and, and care a lot about um, the whole issue of human rights. And we should also not forget that human rights in Australia is also a very, very important issue. And it, we can't be hectoring other countries about their standards of human rights when we have some concerns of our own. And it's very interesting today that we hear Kevin Rudd um, desperately trying to get a 14-year-old boy in Bali freed. And we all hope that he is freed and released very quickly. But very little is said about the fact that there we have our own stolen generation, if you like, of Indonesian fisher boys. Mm -hmm. Now, these are the juvenile crew, crews who are locked up in prisons here in Brisbane, in, um, in Perth, in Melbourne. And we're hearing very, very little from even the human rights organisations about this. And this has been going on, Dave, for, <laughs> for, for months. In, in fact, the district court released, uh, was it Mr Mukhtar, a young guy Mukhtar yesterday from Perth, who'd, who'd been locked up, incarcerated for 15 months. So here we have the Indonesian uh, consul has identified 50 juveniles in jails in Australia, and is it right, therefore, for us to be demanding a release of one 14-year-old who'd been um, tragically arrested for marijuana offence? We hope and wish him all the best. Um, so look, that's, that's probably my take. As I say, you know, there, there are many, many challenges. Um, we're competing in an era of diminishing budgets and who knows what the future of broadsheets are going to be. Um, but certainly, um, yeah, from my perspective, remain totally committed to the coverage of human rights. Terrific. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. And um, on the, on the uh, issue of the Indonesian youths, uh, once again, the country has to rely on the maligned judiciary to, uh, to get them out of strife, we hope. Anyway, um, Michael Ware, who, if you ask me, is completely wasted on CNN and should have been working for the ABC the whole time. <laughs> I like getting paid. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we hit where it hurt. <laughs> and having people watch. <laughs> <laughs> I'm such a bitch. <laughs> oh, it's me. Um, <laughs> thought there was more. Um, all right. I just want to say um, thanks so much for having me. Um, this too is my hometown. Um, and I live but a stone's throw away. So um, it's an enormous pleasure to be here. Um, I must confess, maybe I'm, I'll be a little bit divergent from my, from my friends here. Um, has the media turned its back on human rights? I mean, this places a few things for me upon contemplation. And I mean, it, it needs to be obviously very clear that we're not activists. We don't campaign. And indeed, we're not supposed to believe in anything. And I'm pretty good at that these days. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit jaded, I may know. But that doesn't mean that we turn our backs on human rights. I mean, I can't actually think in my career about an occasion where I've written, say, what I would describe as a human rights story per se. I just write good, compelling stories, I hope. And the human rights are contained therein. The fundamental thing about what I believe is our business and it's also about you know the business of trying to address wrongs and and to further rights is it be it from way back to Aristotle to um, some of the modern writers on the storytelling a good yarn is a good yarn that's what will get it in the paper that's what will get it on the blog as an exclusive that's what may squeeze out those last pennies from the bean counters at the office to let you go and do something. I mean, there's a marketplace, and human rights clearly is pegged as a, a, a core value to our society and to our way of thinking. It's permanently in the firmament of media discussion as much as defence or tax or 
all sorts of things. Many of us hold it much dearer than, than those other things, of course, but nonetheless, it has to compete. So if the media has turned its back on, on human rights, I, I don't think that's the case. And if so, then it's a failing on all our parts. Because as I said in a little session this morning, so I apologise for those who must suffer this twice, I mean, not only do we get the governments we deserve, we get the media we deserve. I mean, if the, the broad newspaper buying, Foxtel subscribing, product purchasing public wanted the stories, then the media barons or the media owners or the editors would be giving them to you. It's a very cause and effect kind of business, Adam. Where I find my faith is, is what I touched on earlier is is a good yarn, is a good yarn. And when you think about it, human rights is, is an excellent yarn in the sense of a storyteller, but it's also something that I find in particular, as you recount the plight of, of certain individuals or where you are highlighting a particular wrong, and especially when you're using human stories to illustrate that, which is to me still the greatest translator of issues and problems from person to person. You know, obviously not erudite discussion, but just a story of one mum and her kid or, or whatever it might be. I find that it's in there that human, uh, human rights finds its, its greatest platform because when I think about it, a, a human rights story, not that I would call it that or framed as such, it's talking about a fundamental issue, isn't it? Of some kind or some variation. A, 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 a wrong that you can just feel to the fibre of your being, to your bones and to your waters. It's instantly recognisable most of the time. Normally it's a great wrong. And that's also translatable to the public. And, and let's think about it. I mean, what we've been talking about here, the, the lists of... of people's interests in headlines, ever-shrinking budgets. You know, to affect human rights like any other issue, who's your audience? What's the public? Particularly in a democracy. And if that's your audience, well, this is what they're into. We have to break through that. And we're not going to get every story and every country and every, every hideous wrong on the planet there. But I think, in essence, it's very hard for us to turn away from it because it is so core and it is something that strikes so very dear to all of us. And I think the onus is on all of us, you know, organisations like yours who in a very clinical and, and Machiavellian sense should be packaging these human rights stories and handing them to us lazy journalists on a platter. <laughs> I'm not joking. I mean... You would be galled at editorial news processes as to what goes in the paper the next day or make it onto the bulletin that night. Um, with understanding of those processes, you can actually inject real issues in there. But normally, it's like Mary Poppins. You've got to give them a spoonful of sugar to go with it. They can't know that that's what they're reading or consuming. So I don't think that we have turned our, our back on human rights. So I think it's just far too fundamental to the core of particularly our Western um, value systems and the, and the way we like to believe in ourselves. But, um, and budgets can be overcome and new media can be embraced, particularly there's no longer such the need for the intrepid um, foreign correspondent to go traipsing into a country per se. More and more with the technology as it evolved, We've got local people who are doing what we once did. So we'd swan in on the plane and have our visa stamped and our passport and check into the nicest hotel. They're there living it all day, every day. I mean, my own personal experience, in Kandahar, when I first arrived there, the day after the Taliban left, I met this kid, 17 years old. He went to high school under the Taliban. Somehow, by some miracle, with all the Dick and Jane dialogues ripped out of his textbook to have woman, he learned pretty good English. And I liked the kid. He was honest and just sincere. I could, he just reeked of it. I loved the kid. He's now a New York Times correspondent. He did three years at Columbia. 
I've got similar stories from Iraqi. That's how we'll overcome our budgets. And to be honest, we'll get better stories. At the end of the day, the journalist's primary role is to seek the truth. I think human rights very much plays into that. It's a fundamental human value that lies generally at the heart of anything that's going to be truthful. And that's my focus. And I don't think that means we've turned away from human rights. Terrific. Very beautifully put. And the, um, uh, uh, you t touched on two uh, issues that I was really hoping to get to later, which is great. Um, and that is, uh, first of all, the uh, what's opening up to us now with the technology in obtaining video footage. I'm pre predominantly a television journalist, although I do radio and online as well. But, but the stuff that we're getting out of places like Papua um, from people who are now sending us files of, of video uh, really do open up closed areas beautifully. But also um, the other point was, and, and I think it really uh, is the thrust of our discussion today, and that is to what extent the media reflects society or vice versa, um, and uh, 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 whether or not we have more of a responsibility than we think we should have, um, and how we go about addressing that. And, and it's, it's a huge can of worms, and, and I don't think we're going to come up with any answers, but it's a good discussion to have. Um, so finally, may I throw to Hugh Remington? Thanks very much, Jeff. I'm in uh, furious agreement with my uh, my friend and former colleague Michael. There, um, I uh, I believe human rights stories, and I've never perceived them that way particularly, are, are great stories. Uh, the reason why the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was written and, and why it got supported was because it spoke to lots of people about things that are vital and important that, that everyone could agree. Pretty much everyone in the Western environment. Uh, you know, the universality of it can be argued, but whatever, whatever, I believe it is pretty universal. People know that there are certain injustices, there are certain rights that, that are worth having, and we know when they get taken away. So at the heart <coughs> of lots of great stories is, is a human rights issue in some ways. And uh, in some ways, as a TV reporter, one of the things you find when you travel a lot around the world it's, it's a, this is an old saw, really, but they, um, as an SA, SAW, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a platitude, but that people are fundamentally the same, their issues are fundamentally the same. And what your job is, is to uh, communicate as effectively as possible and as completely as possible one human being's experience to another <coughs> from a different culture in a different part of the world. And if you can tell that story, then you get a kind of a moment of recognition that can cross cultures and cross distances and, uh, and make something very real. And... And, and then you get that little zing moment that you're, you're, you're always hoping that you might be able to get between uh, the person who's in front of you and some, someone else uh, at home. And it's very gratifying occasionally. <coughs> Excuse me. Over the years when someone will come up to you years later and recount back to you a story that, that, you, that, that, that you did, but it's not your story, of course. It's, it's the person that you've met in the field. It's their story. And uh, it's funny that Michael makes reference to the Mary Poppins moment, the, s the spoonful of sugar. Uh, a lot of the dilemma in telling those stories, because uh, people have terrible experiences in various places, is to, is to communicate it in a way that doesn't terrify and horrify your audience so they turn away from it. It's a, it's a car crash moment. You need to keep them watching uh, and not to turn away from it. And th those are the things that you try to do. I, I, the notion that, that we've turned our back on human rights, again, I don't like that. We haven't turned our back. I don't think we've turned our back on the notion of great stories about what the world is and the time in which we live in it. And to me, that's the fundamental joy of being a reporter, is that, as it happens, I was born in 1961. I will die at some point. I'm in a certain section of, of the time of human history. And in my time on this planet, uh, the great gift of journalism is that you have this opportunity to try and see everything that you possibly can in this random little spell of time that you're on it. And you try to see everything from, uh, from b being in the Oval Office, being with wealth and power, uh, to, to, to every other aspect of human uh, experience, including being in environments where children are literally dying at your feet, dying around you, which are things you don't forget. And then you, you, you try to communicate those experiences, those things across as, w as widely as you can. There's no great intellectual process at work there. In many ways, it is an emotional response, and that you hope to get an emotional response uh, with the stories that you do. Of course, journalism is economics, and it's, uh, I was fascinated by Sophie's 
um, reference there to the Huffington Post and, and just some of the things that got picked up, HuffPost Celebrity, HuffPost Small Business, HuffPost Tech. Now, anyone who is in the media business knows that what that is is a creation of platforms to sell things. Uh, they're, putting, they're putting up HuffPost Tech, uh, not because they're particularly interested in communicating technology news, but because they know there's a lot of money out there and advertisers and people who will uh, plant, you know, pay money to get on that platform. Uh, to get the eyeballs that are interested in technology news. So, uh, so even something which was, you know, um, a, a radical entity like Huffington Post is now doing what the Sydney Morning Herald would do with all the lift outs for the domain and the tech and the media and the legal affairs and the Australian. It's about selling stuff. If you look, I had, had a dinner once with the guy who's the head of the Peabody, I don't know if it's an institute or whatever, but they give out the Peabody Awards for journalism in the U US. He's a professor of media at, um, in, in, in Georgia. And he'd done some research on this and found that in the 1960s, the American network television news bulletins, 70% of their news bulletins were led with an international story, 70% in the 1960s. Now, we have to accept the Cold War was on and the Vietnam War was on, so that might have skewed the figures, but, you know, folks, there is a war on right now. Um, it is now 4% of lead stories are international stories. Uh, he says the reason for that is actually CNN, curious enough, the CNN factor is that when you had a ra an international, <laughs> well, he said basically when you have an international, uh, an outfit that's only doing international news, the argument goes that the, the guys doing the, the editorial decisions in these places are going, well, anyone who's really bloody interested in it will be watching CNN. They'll be over there. It's expensive to get it, but we've got this great story about Michael Jackson's doctor being up on trial. Let's go with that. And so it's, diff it's, it's slid away. There's been a subcontracting out of international news to those agencies. And I'll just make one other brief point on the business of the motivation. To me, being a foreign correspondent, to, to report in the world is just, it's just the greatest gift. I was flabbergasted to discover when I was working at CNN that they have a real problem in getting American journalists to, to work in foreign reporting. Uh, I was stunned. I couldn't see any reason why that, why that wouldn't be the, the height of the job. It was explained to me this way. I said, in foreign reports don't get onto the main news. So you go somewhere and you're really living your life in obscurity. But you get to do, and this was a big story at the time, the Michael Jackson trial, remember he was up for pedophilia or whatever it was, then for six weeks you're on network news every night covering with live hits. At the end of six weeks, everyone in America knows your name. Which I have to say says a terrible thing about what might motivate people going into TV journalism. The point is that they know your name. And that, and that, and that, by any means, that's, you know, that's how you would, you know, you'd get to go there. So, uh, we are. I've got to say, some of those places I travelled to when I was a young reporter, I knew nothing. The levels of ignorance that I possessed were phenomenal. Desire enormous, ignorance massive, um, and and over time, you try just through sheer embarrassment to get a little bit better at it and understand how things go and everything else. I have to say, the people I see coming out now, uh, you know, I didn't get a degree in journalism. I didn't get a degree in anything, actually, to, get to fall into this game. But the people I see now are much better informed, much more international, much more likely in their personal lives to have had a range of, uh, you know, ethnic mixes into their own background, uh, to speak more languages, to have a greater sense of the complexity of the world. We are better informed. The young journos are better informed. They're better educated. Uh, they're, they're classier in, in all kinds of different ways. So uh, in many ways, I just hope that there is some connection between their skills, so much greater than mine ever were, starting off, and the opportunities to get it out there, to talk about great stories. And I say great in journalism terms, often the worst stories, but, but that connect the people on this planet at this hour to each other so that we understand each other and get to love each other a little more. Okay, um, I've got a list of holier-than-thou ABC-style questions here to ask my <laughs> colleagues, but, <coughs> but I thought I'd, I'd open it up to the floor, and uh, I'm sure you've all got a lot of questions, and the first hand up is the <laughs> gentleman at the back with the chequered shirt. Uh, just if you could wait for the microphone to arrive, please. If you're from an organisation, I've asked, I'm asked uh, if you could please introduce who you are and where you're from. Thank you, Ben Shockton from the Human Rights Law Centre, and thank you very much for all of your presentations, very informative. 
Um, for many of us who work for organisations who are trying to get human rights issues in the news, I wondered whether I could ask the panellists for uh, any practical tips, I guess, that you could offer us on how we can assist you to get some of our stories. A lot of us work for a lot of the perhaps more undesirable good in, so in society, so it can be hard to get a lot of those issues in the news. So any practical tips would be much appreciated. Um, and then if I could be so um, bold as to ask a second question and assist you to be Tony Jones, Jeff. There was a huh. tweet that went around from Graeme in us asking Sophie Black what the top five crikey stories were. So perhaps oh, if you could yeah. right <laughs> now? Great, thank oh you. God. Instant feedback. Well, maybe we should go for the sec yeah, second question first, Sophie. Um, oh, look, I don't know off the top of my head. I'd have to look it up, but that is a very cheeky question. But interestingly <laughs> enough, I, I, we are very spoilt at Crikey with, it sounds like I'm sucking up to my readers, but I, I, they're very informed. They, they come to us with a degree of knowledge. That they've already read all the news and, and they want to know about the stories behind the news in, in many ways. And they're infinitely interested in all sorts of things that, that your ord ordinary reader isn't necessarily interested in. S so, uh, but having said that, I mean, they're, they're, they're policy wonks. They want to know about issues like climate change policy. They want to know about Indigenous affairs. Uh, but having said that, they're still politics nerds at heart. So s you'll still see uh, a story about a, partic a particular political conflict playing out, rate higher than something like the, the series that I mentioned before about deaths in custody, which uh, was one of the best pieces of journalism we've ever run. But we were quite taken aback by how little response we got to it. We got, we got people thanking us for it. Uh, we got people <laughs> acknowledging the sort of worthiness of it, uh, but we just didn't. Ne it wasn't necessarily one of our most popular stories, and that's coming from a very, very informed audience. Maybe th there's something to the fact that um, we we didn't uh, we didn't give it that particular hook or yarn. I think one of the things um, that's important to note is that uh, a human rights story, as as you say, Michael, it's not necessarily about uh, presenting someone with a, or readers with a worthy subject, it's about first and foremost writing a good story and writing a story that readers and viewers can identify with and empathise with. Uh, and I think that's one of the great opportunities in terms of the internet and social media that I didn't really touch on. The, this notion that uh, there's the, we're entering this age of interconnectedness that is just extraordinary. We are eroding geographical borders and we're able to empathise with someone, you know, in the Middle East who's currently, you know, in the middle of a, a time of turmoil and, and uprising in a way that we never ever could before and speak to them directly. And I think that's an incre incredible opportunity. But it, uh, yeah, in terms of the top five most popular stories, um, I think still uh, yeah, our, our readers tend to go for for the sort of wonk, the the political conflict uh, before what might be seen as more worthy subjects. And um, uh, perhaps you could address the second, well, the first yes. part of the question Remind too. How can how can uh, what advice can you offer to uh, to help okay. plant stories? For coming from an online publication with no resources, if we can be put in touch with we, we often um, uh, work with NGOs to be put in touch with people on the ground. Um, and if we can be put in touch with someone who can tell us their story uh, and, and write their story or record their story, uh, that's first and foremost what we're looking for. So we're not looking for a press release. We, our eyes will glaze over if we get a press release. But if we have someone saying, hey, I, I've, I've, I've got this person that I really think that you should speak to or, or has a great story to tell, we're immediately interested. And Michael, since you brought it up. Huh. Ooh, that makes me want to get my mouth shut. Um, the advice I'd give, I mean, it's, it's only very general. I'm turning my mind to it now. But essentially, you know, the short answer is media training. I mean, an organisation like this is seeking to be on what? The, the front line, the cutting edge of social change or or maintaining core, fundamental, base hu human values. Well, you're in pretty stiff competition, folks. I've got to tell you, hey, this is the ultimate triumph of the free market. It's the free market of ideas, all right? 
even if we can slap up every you know worthy story humanly possible onto an internet portal, you know, apart from the headlines and trying to grab a reader, you know, you're competing with minutes in a day that an ordinary mother of three kids or or someone slipping out a job trying to pay a mortgage has to devote <coughs> to that kind of reading. I mean, you're going up against players who are seasoned, who are motivated. It's a diverse marketplace in which you're entering. Um, I mean, you got to bring some game, basically. <laughs> um, so I spent too much time around American soldiers. <laughs> um, I even bought a PS3. Um, PTSD treatment. Um, you know, it, it's sort of what I touched on before. It's like, you know, packaging and, and you know, learning the nuances of this market or this, this competition or this battlefield that you're entering. Um, learn the, you know, you've got to pay attention to the rules and all this sort of stuff. All of this sort of stuff. Now, does that involve? <laughs> I, I said I'm on TV. I don't know. Um, constantly amazes me. Um, you know, now if say something like CNN, for example. Okay, there may be so many column inches in um, in Mark's you know broadsheet, um, but say she knows this pain just as intimately as I do. Now, there's many CNNs, for example. Not just the one monolith that we get when we're stuck in a hotel. Right, that's called CNN International. Then there's an entirely different organisation called CNN, basically domestic, USA. You don't see that. You've got to be an American to see that. An entirely different beast. <laughs> then there's its dumb cousin, Headline <laughs> News, which rants and raves about, you know, you know, crimes and trials and all this sort of business. Then there's CNN Espanol. Seen in Turk and goes on and on and on. Multiple delivery platforms. So for, for Hugh and I, say in Baghdad or in any given place, principally we're working for international with a backup for you know the USA network. Given that we were in an American war, we basically had 48 hours of live TV to fill every day. You know, spread out across you know the Michael Jackson trials, a bit of Baghdad, a bit of this. 48 hours in one day of English-speaking um, news coming from the foreign field. And while CNN may soak up a lot of oxygen, I hadn't heard that, that's interesting. I could be right. Um, a viewing pattern with CNN may be, you know, in a small way, illustrative. What we generally seem to find in America is two things, and this is the first bit of my personal opinion. By the time people are getting home from work, they know the news, I think, these days. Um, sitting on our computers at work with our multiple devices, so forth. What I'm finding in America, say, with the rise of Fox News and MSNBC, you know, partisan um, news programming, it's almost as though people want to be given their news or have their news, and then they want to be told what to think and feel about it. All but. I mean, I don't put, put it that far, but that's, that's one extreme way of looking at it. So, when there's a Haiti, when there's a war, when there's an earthquake, what do American viewers do? In droves, they leave Rachel Maddow and Bill O'Reilly and they come to CNN for two, three days. And they get their facts and then they go back to where they came from. That's the kind of market you're competing in. Here's human rights, go sell us. Seriously. That's what you've got to do. Now, does that mean employing some washed-up old hack on a consultancy? <laughs> God, I hope not, for your sake. Don't do it. I'll shoot you myself. <laughs> <laughs> but certainly, you've got to start stepping up the game. I mean, we've got a vastly increased marketplace, vastly increased com uh, delivery systems. Even with news, there's a plethora of sources, is there not, for information. The trick now is, who do you trust? Where do you go? Who can you count on? Who's going to deliver? Brands. So that, that's the way this very fluid market's working, and Amnesty needs to get in the goddamn game. Okay, can, I, can I just offer just something very quickly on that? Because uh, I think what you need is, what journalists are looking for, is an issue and a story. And the story is at its best when it's a human story. So <coughs> there are issues that are out there, whatever it is. An issue on its own is a government paper. 
uh, a story is what brings it to the public, and that requires a person. Now, you do have the connections, mm. uh, and this gives you the inside track. Mm. You know through your people, with your trusted connections with people, that you'll have someone who is in that issue. They are the victims, if you like, of, of that issue, or they could be the heroes of the issue, and, and with a story to tell. And if you've got a relationship with the journalist established, um, someone who you trust, etc., it really is in that circle of trust. Then if you've got that story attached to that issue, suddenly you can get it out there and you, and you get the benefit of the megaphone. And I'll just say one other very quick thing about human rights. Anyone who's ever been in, this, in the area of trying to look after biodiversity, uh, looking after species in the world, mm -hmm. know that there are fashionable species and there are unfashionable <laughs> species. Try and save yeah. a stick insect, you know, good luck. But if you're trying to save a whale or a harp seal or a panda bear, <laughs> I'm not sure how they bear, uh, then, then you're going okay. And this is the same with human rights issues. There will be a fashion and they run backwards and forwards, and, and they'll, they can spring up. Reba Kadir, I think, is speaking uh, here. She might, she's not here. But, but no one knew much about the Uyghurs. Uh, then the Chinese tried to shut it down, and she's, there was a fashion, and she was able to get a message out uh, through that sort of window that was open, courtesy of the, the nice Chinese government, to get, a, to get an issue out there. So you pick your moment, too, and, and, uh, you know, and try to get it. But an issue and a story, a journal you can trust, and a bit of luck. Good luck. Mark Todd. Yes. Um, yeah, no, I'd in endorse all of those comments. And I'd say if you've got a story to tell, pick up the phone and give us a call. Uh, we'll mm. always... Six, oh, six we'll three. always... <laughs> yeah, have, have, have a listen. Just don't call anyone else. Uh, uh, no, exactly. <laughs> don't go to the opposition. <laughs> or the Defence and foreign uh, affairs correspondent. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, start making contacts with the, with the papers. Um, it also helps to understand the news cycle. This is really mm. important. It, it continues to surprise me how many people have phoned me up when they got you know, at five o'clock in the afternoon and basically the whole bureau has gone tactical and, and uh, it is just no way known that uh, an anyone's going to even pick up a phone. So morning's always a good time, you know, nine o'clock. Um, if you're organising a press conference, try to always have it in the morning. That gives us a nice lot of time then to get the photographers organised and... Um, Look, uh, yeah, we can come out. We can bring it up at uh, at news conference. We have a uh, at in Canberra. The the news cycle essentially works that by eleven o'clock the first news list goes off. That's what we're filing from Canberra that day. That's what we've got. It gets reviewed, and at uh, three o'clock there's a final cut, final uh, decision on what's what's moving from Canberra, and that's that's pretty well non-negotiable unless yeah, it's something really ex an extreme news event. So if you can get into the, the, s the sequence of the news cycle, the newspaper news cycle, and also um, start developing um, contacts with the online, the, uh, the newspaper online now, which is virtually, it's, uh, it's, it's a separate news organisation on itself. Often, for example, um, people get a little bit confused because they'll say, look, I spoke to so-and-so from the Australian online, and uh, now you're calling me up. We're actually two different... Uh, Groups of people. Uh, we we all, you know we work together, but the online now more and more, at least in, in from the Australian, are delivering independent content. And, uh, so look, I'd, I'd uh, yep start developing the, the contacts. Keep in you know, keep in mind as my colleague said about the story. If you've got a message to sell, you know, and and the earlier you can flag it up, always always the better. Yeah. And as well as a story, you've got to remember the audience. Mm -hmm. So if I'm sometimes, and I seriously do this, sometimes when I'm assessing the news value in something I'm doing and whether this is going to be something that my boss is going to buy as a yarn, um, I put my redneck goggles on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, if it's a story to that audience, then I'm afraid it's going to sell. Uh, so um, so it's, it just, just keep, it's not something obviously that we can do regularly, but <laughs> we'll do our heads in, but... But something that uh, something to keep in mind that that is the audience, you know. And uh, if you can sell a human rights story to that audience, then you'll sell it to everybody. Now, um, the, before his arm drops off, this gentleman here in the black shirt. <laughs> yeah, that's you. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, my name is Keith Connolly. I'd just like to say, um, to the traditional owners here, thank you for allowing me to talk in your country. Um, I'm from the Gimma Wallaby, living the people from Cairns. I'm also in the media as well. I have a couple of media stories that you'd probably be interested in. Um, one is the war on terrorism itself. There's a biggest group that's been around for years. They're called the KKK. They're one of the biggest, the Ku Klux Klan, if some of you don't know. They're the biggest terrorist organization. They've been around for years. 
why hasn't, haven't they been classified as a terrorist group? Um, is it because they're white? Or are they white, wear white sheets? <laughs> don't know. The correlation between the Australian government and the governments that happen here and the Hitler government. The only difference is there's the swastika. We were put on concentration camps for missions. Um, I'll tell you a story. My grandmother was only six years old when she was taken from Munsee, Starkey River. She was put on chains. She walked 50 miles, put on a boat. For three days, she was in a boat that came from Cooktown to Cairns, only given water. Then she was taken over to what was called an Anglican mission, the same style like a concentration camp, and fed rations. These correlations to what had happened, and we're talking about human rights story, and if you're going to be talking about human rights story, why hasn't there been no correlation? Um, the governments of the day today are still talking about the intervention, which is probably glossy words to use, when it's still the same like a concentration camp our people are still living it here in Australia. The trouble is we haven't got into a boat and sailed over to New Zealand. You know, we never, because this is our country, we never want to leave here, but we get a hell of a lot of people want to come here. You know, first with Captain Cook, who's not really a captain, he's a lieutenant. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, these, Fantastic. these <laughs> stories, all the time, but the stories were human rights stories. We can make correlations to a lot of people that leave their country and come here. And we're under the same. But I think the big news story is, and I, I, I don't know why Obama doesn't actually look at it. I know we're talking about war on terrorism. The war on ter terrorism seems to be people who either are of color or of Middle Eastern background. When there's the biggest group that's going around and they're still here and they're still living, around the place, maybe they own most of the multinational companies around, and they're called the KKK. Why doesn't somebody unearth that as a story? Thank you for your excellent question, and it brings up, <laughs> it brings up a lot of points, I have to say. Um, and then two uh, that I have singled out, is first of all, um, the, uh, the use of, of language and whether or not the media is too fast in adopting the spin, if you like, of, uh, uh, you know, terminology. Is somebody an illegal immigrant or are they an asylum seeker? Um, and, uh, and also, I, 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 I just wonder out loud if, and, you know, addressing both the Ku Klux Klan issue and also um, the uh, injustices that uh, Indigenous people have suffered and still suffer in this country, um, whether or not there's a, a, a measure of viewer fatigue. So keeping that audience thing in mind again, uh, and with your redneck goggles on for a moment, do, do, do uh, does the audience is, is the audience getting tired of hearing those stories over and over again? So, does anybody would anybody like to address? I've got to say, I don't think that story's your grandmother. I don't think you can get tired of that story. Uh, how can you get tired of that story? Um, I, I, I think the thing about it is, is um, I think there is a broad understanding, except those who will deny it to their graves, that, uh, that at least in broad in broad scope of the injustices and the and the events that took place at the time of contact and and thereafter th there's a broad view of, of, of general general understanding i'm certainly not speaking about specific understanding that may not be complete and it will vary from individual to individual but uh you know those a story like that even if it's an historical story it's not technically a new story but it's part of the story of the nation and uh and there's always there's always room for that. There's, there's been some fantastic writing in the United States, you know, of the last generation of, of stuff about the uh, Native Americans, uh, so that so that stories that have been buried away were, were up again. They were alive and being read about. I've just been <laughs> slightly current for me because I just finished reading a, a book about the real Geronimo, and uh, and what that was all about. The complexity of those those things. I think <coughs> there is an enormous field and interest in 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 trustworthy information about things that took place. Uh, as news stories, uh, it, it's, it's not technically news to the same degree. It didn't happen today. But, the, um, but those kinds of stories are essential parts of the Australian story. And, and, and also, we talked earlier about how do you get your story out. We talk about news cycles and so on. There is also the feature cycle, if you like. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the news pages of the newspapers or, or the 
TV news are the, uh, not the only place you, you plant those, I mean, you get those stories told. Uh, you get them through everywhere that you can, but they tend to be more, the, the older it is, the more likely it is to be feature length. But uh, those stories should be told and told and told. Um, yeah, just to be a very annoying interviewee, um, I might pose a question back. I've actually been giving this some thought since I come home. I've been away pretty much since 9-11, except for a couple of boozy Christmases. Um, I've only just returned, and it's almost like re acclimatizing as you can imagine, cold flea in every other way. But the story of your mob has been occurring to me. When I first came home, pretty much a, a decade, I was otherwise occupied. I come back, and at one point I was compelled just to write down a litany of headlines on Indigenous issues. Not the story, just headlines. Mm. West Australia, the ongoing fallout from the Doomadgee matter, which I was unaware of at the time, and just this litany of things. Just death of a thousand cuts type stuff. And I thought to myself, as a new citizen of the international community, any other country on the planet? Well, there'd be outrage about that. And when you discuss viewer fatigue, I mean, I know about that. A ruck became TV death at a certain point in the war. Like, they actually monitor TV you know, news, particularly minute by minute. Who's watching, who's not, goes up and down. Ah, the Stein, nonsensical one. I can see how Indigenous issues might be the same here. But my question is this. Having just returned from overseas, traipsing about, why has this story never penetrated, in my view, the, the international news cycle? It's almost as though we're given a free pass mm. on this. So many other countries and whatever, you know, we, we like to impress upon them the need to maintain their human rights. And yet I found myself coming home, I'm Queensland born and bred. I mean, I grew up with this shit. You know, I was the frog in the boiling water. Um, so, yeah, it was quite abrasive to come home. I think there might be something to that. Now, if someone can tell me why we get a leave pass on this, I don't know. I think the, the exception to that might be Britain, <laughs> which likes doing stories Trading on Australian... Power. Yeah, well, Australians doing mm. bad things, you know, to I Aboriginal. Mean, <laughs> and I think the intervention as well, I think there's something to the fact that a certain hook or an angle tends to become a template across the mainstream media around certain issues and for indigenous issues it became the intervention so there's been this bizarre concentration on the northern territory for however many years now yeah, around yeah. this issue and that came to define indigenous issues as if there was nothing going on beyond that the same goes for for asylum seekers i mean that issue that is the one human rights issue that is constantly in the headlines in this country but not from any kind of human rights perspective in any way. It's about the politics and in the people at the heart of that policy are very rarely discussed on a daily basis. And the media savvy amnesty would be able to tell us how much the BBC or CNN or CCTV in China is covering the, pre the mm. asylum seeker issue. I wouldn't have a clue. Personally, I hadn't noticed it while I was away. I thought it was all over with that first gear, but whatever it was, remember that from you? Team all back then. Yeah. Um, Mark? Um, look, I, I think definitely um, no, no one denies that <coughs> in terrible, terrible injustices have, have, have been done to the uh, Indigenous peoples of uh, Australia. Um, they, are, they do and they continue to get a very good ventilation, particularly, I think, you know, with, with our newspaper, we focus on, on the rights, the wrongs, the challenges, the, uh, the the intervention, whether it be in Queensland, you know, across the top, the, the territory, the Kimberleys. Um, so, I'd probably take a little bit of issue with you. I'd, I'd say that you know, we it's been getting a good airing and it's getting a lot of a lot of ink, printers ink. Um, but we'll always continue to monitor it. We won't. Uh, it is something I can tell you that the editor is uh, is very keen to see continued. Um, and uh, we, all I can say is, you know, you know we've got a you know, record to back it up. So um, I would disagree with you, though, in the comparison, the analogy with Nazi Germany and uh, the, the KKK. Look, I'd, I think it's uh, it's definitely worthy of, uh, of a, um, a look at their their activities and uh, to the extent to which they they exist up in up you know up in North North Queensland. Um, 
right? Yeah, no, I mean, you make a, va you make a valid point. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. No, I'm, I'm not dismissing it. I'm, I'm certainly unaware, apart yeah. from the KKK existing as a uh, as a Southern United States uh, yeah. phenomenon, yeah. Uh, which I thought was in pretty heavy decline. I, yeah. I didn't know it was got anywhere global. Yeah. I'd be happy to have a look at it. And just yeah. one small point you said there yeah. about the United States yeah. going uh, overseas. It is worth reminding ourselves that the first Gulf War, which was to take Iraq out of Kuwait, uh, the intervention in Somalia, uh, the intervention that eventually came over Bosnia, uh, the intervention in Kosovo, uh, I'll leave aside Iraq because I think that was uh, was misguided and was inappropriate and leave that one aside. But the NATO intervention in Libya was all by Western nations in defense of a Muslim population. Mm -hmm. And it just needs to be acknowledged that the United States doesn't get any points for that. Um, but I've been to most of those. In fact, I think all of them, apart from Libya. And uh, and the people being liberated at the end were, were fundamentally Muslim. And I think it's fair yeah. to say that, that um, no matter uh, what, you know, the suspicions about uh, race being a motive mm. is, um, I think everybody at this table would be more than mm. interested in doing a story on the KKK if they found it in Australia. Mm. As well, a certainly if it had merit. But yeah, well is, is there a danger, though, that by writing about the KKK, you're going to... They could be just a little cell of yeah, half a dozen yeah. wackos. Well, they're going to actually start well creating uh, problems. On, on, on that point, th let yeah. me have a crack. Well, well I, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid that in the interests of everybody having their issues addressed, we're going to have to move on. So thank you for that. And, and, and I think we, uh, we gave it a good, uh, good go. Um, shall we perhaps this, uh, bring the microphone down the front here, this uh, gentleman in the checkered shirt? Thanks very much. Um, so my name is James Evanitakis from the University of Western Sydney. I have two questions. One is, do you think that there's still a prestige issue um, between journalists working online compared to um, uh, broadsheets? Yeah, and there's scum. <laughs> <laughs> which, which ones, I suppose? Um, and, uh, and I kind of I, I ask these in questions I've had with people like Paul Colgan and others from um, News Online. And my second question is probably a, a little bit um, cheeky, but um, the Andrew Bolt decision. Oh, I knew. <laughs> I knew, yeah, someone was going to ask it. It might as well be me. Um, domestic, you guys. Uh, <laughs> um, was it a slap in the face of free speech or a um, defence of um, a, a loony who's against, um, I suppose, a, a, a discussion if, a, about human rights and racial discrimination? Okay. Uh, and again, uh, we're, we're, we've been going fairly slow so far, so um, I think it's time to speed things up so everybody gets a, a go. So... Uh, I'm not Short answers is what you're saying, isn't it, Jeff? Sorry? Short answers. Short answers would be good, but also um, also just be aware of the fact that I might be, you know, thrown to other questions yeah. after one answer or two answers as opposed to all five of us. Sophie, prestige, oh. first of all. <coughs> Le less so. I think there was, a, there definitely when we started, there was a real snobbery there and there was a real sense that there was less legitimacy to a story that we may have broken. Uh, that's not to say the media wouldn't have taken it and run with it. They just never credited us with <laughs> breaking the story. We don't find that so much anymore. Uh, and I think that has a little bit to do with the fact that people are recognising the potential of the internet and the fact that news is just getting on with it without the mainstream media necessarily. Um, at which we've talked a lot about citizen journalism today. We've talked about the, the potential of the technology on the ground and that people are telling their own stories. Uh, and so I think there's a, a much less distinction. I think a good story stands out regardless of where it's been published now. And, and sorry? I was going to say a quick measure of that, perhaps, it's a very poor measure, is in the last year, what, Ariana Huffington and Tina Brown pocketed, what, half a billion between them for selling Huffington Post and Daily mm. Beast? They're rising in stature, I can tell you. Mm. Um, I'm willing to take on that. Oh, do you want to have a go? Look, here, certainly I don't see that there's a prestige issue. In fact, I, I see the online people as being way ahead of me. I'm, from a technology point of view, I'm from Dinosaur Swamp and still put ZC, ZC, the thing the old Telex does. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, 
No, no, I think we're, we treat each other equally and, and with uh, respect and we, we, there's a lot of, in, in, at least in our newsroom in Canberra, a lot of good cooperation here. Um, yeah. I think the Andrew Bolt thing, uh, we've got to uh, be careful not to mm. have a conversation in absolutes, which mm. is a big danger in any debate like this. Yes, it was a slap to free speech, absolutely. But, um, you know, there's also a line that has to be made where somebody's actions hurt somebody else. And that's why we have a judiciary. And in this case, the judiciary, uh, you know, made a clear decision that, that has caused, you know, caused, caused controversy. But whatever the, whatever the judge decided was going to cause controversy. But... Um, but can, I, can I just say, Bolt yeah. works for the same network that I do. Among his, yeah. He's got a million outlets. He's been deeply silenced, this man. Yeah. But um, uh, I, I disagree with almost everything Bolt says on almost every subject. Uh, I don't have a problem with him appearing on the network, and, and I've had arguments with other people in the network about putting him, because he represents a certain point of view, and I've got he's quarantined within his own show, and that's fine. I don't mind him being there. As for the Racial Discrimination Act and its use, uh, I am actually I find myself... Um, instinctively finding that there's no problem in the the, uh, the the judge making a negative finding against him. Uh, freedom of speech is 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 of high value to me, and I think countries where it, where it is well protected are better countries. Uh, I think that the United States, one of the great strengths of the United States, is it is deeply held, but it does create problems. Every court case, for example, gets well worked over before it gets a chance to get in court. All that all that kind of stuff. But I do think that every journalist knows that there are restrictions to speech, defamation laws, conservative court laws. There are other things. And, and if, you if you've got a point you really want to make, and if you think it's a valuable point to make about light-skinned Aborigines, I can't see what the real value is in the point, but if that's what you feel you want to, to make, I, I, think it, it, I think make it in a civil way. Mm. There, is, there is a need for civility. I don't think we're a better country for becoming as appalling as some of that stuff was. So I think that... Uh, the, the bleating about free speech is not because he's unable to say the mm. fundamental points he wants to make, but that it is uh, vile in tone and that it was also wrong in fact. Mm. Mm. And, and so on, on those grounds, you know, he's got mm. all the That's speech he needs, I think. Yeah. Oh. Okay, uh, question from the gentleman over here. I'm sorry, I've, I've, I've been spreading the, um, I've just been accused of misogyny. That's terrible. I'm so sorry. I feel, here, have mine. Um, the, 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 I've, I've been spreading it out and I'm afraid that for the first half of today there were only men with their hands up. So, I've, you, I'm sorry, I'm also a bit blind. You're next. Oh, your chance, go for it. There's a microphone. Okay, thanks, I will. Um, well done, thank you. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name's Sarah Madison, I'm from the University of New South Wales. Uh, the phrase new values has been bandied around a little bit and I just wanted to get the panel's response to two that I think are particularly relevant when we're talking about reporting on human rights. The first is novelty. Uh, and, you know, as someone who has often pitched stories to um, newspapers, often the response is, well, what's new about that? And I guess, you know, part of the little stunt I just pulled is, you know, actually women are often invisible. Actually drawing attention to that repeti repeatedly is part of, you know, what being an activist is about. I is think maybe you don't sit there with your hand like this will answer yeah. either the previous answer, you know. Anyway, <laughs> um, so, but my point is about novelty, that often for, for human rights activists who've been struggling away on the same issue for decades, um, finding that new angle is, is a real challenge. So mm. that's, that's one issue. The other one, the other value is, um, is balance, which I think in the Australian media in particular has become, it's become a really sad kind of disease, I think, particularly um, during the Howard era where I think what happened at the ABC and their interpretation of balance was just this level of banality. You know, let's talk about climate science and now let's hear from some bug-eyed English loony who pretends he's a member of the House of Lords and let's <laughs> pretend that those two values are, uh, two points of view are, are balanced and should balance each other out. Um, you know, I, thi I think again that for, for um, people interested in advocating for human rights it can be particularly difficult when what's often put as the balance to the argument is 
it's not based in fact, is, is based in ideology, but is given equal weight in the media. And I think that those, the, the novelty and the balance question are particularly problematic. Are you thinking about a specific issue? I'm just curious, are you talking about a specific issue uh, when you talk about human rights and the balance? Have you got an, an issue in mind? We're, we're well, I'm thinking of things like, um, you know, Triple J, the, the youth media station, uh, youth radio station, um, had, when the ABC was kind of under the pump from the Howard government, had as part of their policy that they couldn't have the um, the opposition spokesman on youth affairs, spokesperson of, on youth affairs on the station unless the minister also agreed to come on. So all the minister had to do was say, no, I don't want to comment on that story, and Triple J wouldn't, wouldn't mm. hear from the opposition. Mm. So that the balance actually pr got in the way of particular stories being mm. told. I think climate change, which you know, we're increasingly aware is a human rights <laughs> issue, particularly mm. if you live on Tuvalu, um, is, you know, I think a lot of people in this room would agree that the reporting on that, whilst might appear to be balanced, actually, you know, there is this constant putting up of views that are not based in scientific fact, as though they are somehow mm. a balance to the scientific opinion. I think, you know, probably for a lot of people in the room, the way that debate has been conducted in the media has been particularly disappointing, frustrating, and yet, you know, if you're the, the, the advocate on the, the climate science side of things, you might also, <laughs> also be con confronted with the, the novelty question. And what's new about that? Haven't we been hearing about that for a few years now? Well, you know, yes, but we're, we're still chasing that issue around. But I don't think we should uh, be uh, too... My, sorry. my friend before raising the issue of, <coughs> of uh, Indigenous rights, you know, I mean, I think that that's another area where mm. the, the balance question is particularly problematic. Mm. I was just going to say, I don't think, on, at least on the climate side, that we should be too prescriptive and that all views, sh there should be a space for all views. I mean, we do have a you know, robust free speech here. Um, and and I, do, uh, I do, I am occasionally conflicted, particularly uh, with some of the comments that Alan Jones makes. I sort of tend to be in sympathy with him. Uh, sympathy with Alan Jones. I Robbie Deans either. So, uh, no, I, 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 I share your, your, your concerns, and, uh, but I, I think yeah, that we shouldn't, we shouldn't be uh, too prescriptive, and, and, and it's, a, it's a broad I church. I guess and what I'm saying yeah. is it seems that from journalists, yeah. the obsession with balance has led to a dumbing down of, right. of what I remember as being a greater level of critical analysis, or certainly if you go to the yeah. UK, I think what you read in mm. uh, the broadsheet papers in the, in the yeah. UK where journalists are giving a more rigorous level of critical analysis to stories. Mm. So it's not just a banal, here's one side and here's mm. what the other side mm. has to say. There's actually the journalists themselves engage mm. in some analysis. And I think what we mm. have seen more and more here is here's one side, here's another side. They can just both stand there equally. Mm. Well, there's, there's another school of thought on this and that there's too much opinion yeah. and, and <laughs> not enough news. And yeah, I don't think you can have it both ways. Mm. Um, Look, news priorities do vary. When I was in uh, Afghanistan on a, on a NATO visit and a colleague from the German uh, paper Bild um, was saying that virtually every day they have a, a story on Afghanistan on their front page. Um, certainly uh, we haven't reached that stage yet in Australia, but it shows the, sort of, you know, the differing levels of uh, priorities accorded to uh, the other. If you, if you want a bit of amusement, go and get to The Spectator, which I picked up at the airport coming up from Canberra today. And in the front, there's an article by George Brandis in which, among other things, uh, he's, he's making his point about uh, freedom of speech in there. But he, he makes a case which is the exact opposite of yours, saying that the media has been uh, caught uh, hostage <coughs> to you know, elitist ideas mm. and that you just don't see enough of the people who are um, dissidents against uh, the climate change uh, you know, collective view, and 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 that's also out there in the space. That you know, that this is the reality of it: is that you get people vociferously arguing that why do we have to hear from that man Garneau uh, when there are plainly good people like Ian Plymer, where you can get your advice on climate change about. And, you know, it's out there. I, I accept what you're saying. As journos, we're not supposed mm, well. we're not supposed to. Do it, but if you get a guy like Lord Monckton, and if you look mm. at the way in which, or the non-Lord Monckton, uh, I've gone online with a couple of things. Uh, about it, including uh, rang the when he was claiming still to have a Nobel Prize. Uh, I went to the bother of actually bringing Stockholm and getting the reaction that the guy heads the Nobel Prize committee, you know, who'd never heard of the bugger. And um, <laughs> and I think that one of the things about that is that he may get a fair amount of time. He may have his own acolytes and fan base, but by and large, just to take that one example, I don't think he's taken immensely seriously. I think it's very much changed uh, since the Monckton's. It's interesting to compare Monckton's second tour of Australia to his first tour, which was, his first tour received blanket coverage uh, 
among uh, on the ABC as well, Breakfast Radio, Radio National. Uh, he was given a huge amount of airtime, uh, and some would say that it was an opportunity to argue with him and dismiss his comments. But that's ultimately not what came across. On his second tour, he wasn't given nearly the same amount of coverage, and I understand that there has been a lot of discussion internally at the ABC about this idea of balance and climate change because they are answer answerable to their public. There is uh, a very vocal minority, it must be said, uh, around the issues of climate change. Uh, and I know that a, a lot of sort of talkback hosts have sort of despaired at the fact that they have to give airtime to the person that calls up every single time they mention climate change to dismiss the science of climate change. I think that they are moving away from that. And I think part of this false balance is also to do with lazy journalism. It's easier to run pro and then anti, left and then right, rather than actually testing the soundbite just to run the soundbite. And you'll often see hear that at the top of an ABC News bulletin. You'll hear something that sounds like it's an opposition press release, as if that's the top news story of the day. Part of that, I believe, has to do with diminishing resources. But yeah, it's, it's also worth noting that Julian Burnside was saying a little earlier. There was someone asked him a question about uh, about points of view that are hostile to yours. I, I, I don't want to mi misquote the question, but he was saying that you know you've got to reach out to people. If people don't get a sense that they're being listened to, then mm. then then it actually increases the levels of anger. Mm. So to a certain degree, the journalism, in fact, the whole political system, I is there to vent in in verbal ways mm -hmm. areas of, of conflict. So uh, I think it, it's incumbent on all citizens to inform themselves properly. Now, some people imagine they're informing themselves properly that there is a big conspiracy that's uh, uh, that's uh, preventing them learning the truth about climate change, and that is that it's a big hoax put together by scientists who are hungry for grants, um, you know, and that's the view that they're going to take. But if you, but if the citizenship is is properly informed about it, then uh, if they care about science, they'll be led in one direction. And that the thing about it to me is that not that there's great debate really fundamentally about the science, except absolutely on the fringes, but there is legitimate debate about what you do about it, and and that's a space which is highly contestable and which differs from country to country and within this country. And, and that's a very productive area for debate because that's when we're all entitled, we've all got a stake in, in it, you know, the level at which something is done about it. But um, and who wants to assume the role of arbiter of fact? I mean, that's pretty delicate ground in our business that you've got to be very, very obviously careful with that. And at the other end of this slippery slope, don't forget, sits Fox News. Um, also the, the fact ultimate that- ultimate and fact-free opinion. The fact that media is built around <laughs> The fact that media is built around conflict as well, and I think that template has been applied to climate science. And uh, the climate gate emails, for example, is a classic example of that. Blanket coverage around the, the original release of those emails, not a whole lot about the s several investigations that exonerated the scientists of any wrongdoing. But the most painful point for me that you raised was that repetition, reinventing the wheel all mm. the time. Mm. I mean, for me, it was 10 years of the war's not going well, the war's not going well, the war's not going well. You know, before that, when I was here in the 90s, it was the Department of Family Services isn't working. The Department of Family Services isn't working. Um, it kills you, and chances are you won't change anything anyway, but you've got to have a go. I'm, uh, I'm going to have to draw a line under that, apart from just say, if you want to... Keep um, it up. I'm, I'm happy to have a conversation with you later about the processes in the ABC, and anyone wants to join it, um, but, yeah except Michael, who pass out. But the, um, <laughs> the, uh, 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 the, I have to say that as a journalist, obviously a, a, the ABC is different by its very nature um, and is confronted with a different set of you know, problems. Uh, but uh, as an ABC journalist, I have to say my favourite phrase is uh, along the lines of a spokesman for the Immigration Department declined our invitation to comment, <laughs> which of course indicates balance. Um, <laughs> the lady, uh, woman up the back in the black top, Oh, the chap, the, okay, thank you. I know, who I know, but, you know. Uh, <laughs> hi, my name is Kevin Finn, and I'm an independent graphic designer. Uh, I just want to talk about the 24-7 news cycle. Um, there's a, uh, an ex-CIA operative called Larry J. Cole, and in one of his books he says that um, George W. Bush was getting his reports, taking his reports from CNN, which you guys would be probably happy about, um, before the CIA because it was quicker, the, the, the reporting on the ground and that 24-7 news cycle was actually getting into the White House before the CIA were bringing in the, the reports. Now, does that 24-7 
the news cycle put pressure on journalists to the extent where the Murdoch hacking will put rights out the window that they'll actually just try and get a story in any way they can, hacking any way at all. So this is th the question is based around the 24-7 news cycle and the pressure it puts on, on um, journalists. It's a great question. Before anyone else answer, can I just say that the, the yeah. guy they were watching was Michael. And, you should, and I'm serious about he this. Does you, sh you, should, you should be aware that, 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 that this was how it was in 2005 and 2006. And when John McCain, who was then a contender oh. for, the, for the presidency, uh, made the statement that, uh, that everything was fine in Iraq. There are suburbs you can just walk around. You just you Strong. find there's no Strong. thing. And, and Michael Weir got up on the thing Strong. and said... Strolling in Baghdad and absolutely <laughs> called him out on it and basically said it was roll gold bullshit. And uh, it immediately went into the news cycle, corrected it, and, and there had to be a comeback. So just so that you know you've got class on the table, uh, there he is. Just sitting there. Typical goddamn CNN journalist. Can't even get it right here, Remington. Um, yeah, Bro broadly McCain right most yeah, of the time. McCain had said you can take it. He said he corrected an anchor in America and said, well, you're three months behind there, Wolf, but um, there's parts of Baghdad that are so safe, two Americans can take a stroll. Um, in a better American accent, obviously. Um, and yeah, I asked him to show me in which part of Neverland these areas existed. Um, <laughs> he spent the next two years trying to get rid of me for that. <laughs> um, but the 24-7 thing is a blessing and a curse, clearly, as much in life is. Um, I learned to love the immediacy of it. Um, it's hard to censor you. Um, and, yeah, certainly say on CNN. Like I said, it, it also plays to the thing I pointed to earlier about content. You know, Amnesty's got to see itself as a content provider in terms of the media game and, and strategy for action. Really. Because the, the news organisations are now and shall forever be starving for content. So it's a good way to focus it. But, um, you know, with so much time to fill and, you know, say a focus at that period on an American war, I found the 24-7 thing, once I got to know it, because I'm a print hack through and through, to be really quite refreshing. You could be just discussing stuff as you're learning it or as you're verifying it. Um, it's almost real time, like watching the bombs fall in shock and all live on TV. Um... There's a real potency to that. It is also, obviously, with any right, be it human rights or any other, there's responsibility, I believe, that comes with all these things. You know? It's, there's no free lunch here, folks. Um, so with the, the power that makes me God on a 24-7 news network, and I know President Bush is watching, and <coughs> actually the rumour goes it was Fidel Castro who suggested to Ted Turner that he set it up, CNN. Um, <laughs> just a quirky fact issue. Um, <laughs> there is, there's, there's great potential there that I certainly was still in the middle of discovering when I, I moved back here and it's akin, I think, to the new media. Mm. Certainly for me, there's areas of, of growth. The markets are for ideas, mm. for selling stuff, for everything is in great flux. We all need to get our heads around If I can just say, I think uh, at the heart of Kevin's story, I think is a concern that there is, that there is a, as risk, the same levels of risk, the risks associated with it. And, that mm. and I think the thing about the, the hack, hacking business in the New Zealand papers in, in Britain is that you, uh, when I lived in Britain, there were 17 morning newspapers mm -hmm. in London. And they compete life and death every day for, uh, against each other. It goes also to the question of analysis in British newspapers, is that you can afford to occupy a niche and, and deliver to that niche, which you can't here. You've, you've got to be broader and, and do things. But what happened there is that the tabloid papers sell on their front page. They sell through habit, but they sell through the front page. You're going to get a whipping good read. Now, that's a lot to get up every day. Mm -hmm. And so that was a tension and a pressure to deliver a better front page splash than the other guy day after day after day. The commercial pressures were on to do that. If you look at the 24 hour news cycle, it's not a commercial pressure, I think, to the same degree to do it. I, you know, there are big stories that go on. Y y you know, if, if uh, the Christchurch earthquake, for example, you raced across there to cover that. Everyone's in there. You want to get down there. You want to get broadcasting from it very quickly. Um, you want to get an idea as to what's going on on the ground. But you don't have to invent anything. Mm -hmm. You don't have to. You know, there may be other ethical issues. You know, do you walk into the house if there's a place uh, where, where the police haven't got to? You know, should you go through and see if, you, if there might be survivors beneath the broken building? If you do, what do you do about them? Or do you stay out? of There's all kinds of issues that, that are thrown up by it. 
but that deeply corrupted, institutionalized notion that cheating and lying and, and doing stuff which you would uh, blush to think about in the light of day, but that becomes your routine method of working so that you can get a scoop to satisfy your editor, to go further up the tree. I, in my experience in, the, in living in the 24-hour seven cycle at CNN, it didn't work that way. You worked, if you're in a place like Iraq, you work your ass off, you, believe me, don't work 24-7 if you want an easy life. But you, but you are constantly confronted by events that you can immediately take to air. And you're checking, you're doing all those, th those other kinds of things. It's a great storytelling device because it has that immediacy and, and stuff that goes with it. I don't see that evidence of corruption. The only thing I found when in my time at CNN, which is deeply in the 24-7 cycle, was during the, uh, the, the war with Hezbollah, and I think it was 2006, now, for some reason in that war, and not the later Gaza incursion, there was a s very strongly pro-Israel feel came into, s into the CNN uh, thing. And it was, it, was a, 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 it was uncomfortable to be in on that. And there was one reporter, a fine r reporter, who they went on later to sack, a guy called Carl Penhall, went to a school that had been blown to bits in the, uh, in the, in the early stages. Entire? Yeah, entire, right down on the border. And, they, and he had a rip-roaring story, this is, uh, went once the ceasefire had come, of these kids going back into the shattered school. I think the people had died in the town. He'd gone back and trying to find books and, and learning. It's just a great story about what happens the day after the war. when it's all. And they held that story back, going to the question of balance, because uh, they felt that they couldn't run that until they'd had the story about the Israeli school that had also mm -hmm. been shattered. Well, the fact was there was no Israeli school that had been shattered. And, uh, and that story got one run, got pulled at that amount of time. So uh, I, I wouldn't want to say there's not a capacity for corruption I in the system. And I was deeply unhappy about that. I think internally they looked at themselves and did a, a far better job of the next major conflict, which was the one back in, in into Gaza. But that, that uh, and I've got to say, the News Limited papers here in Australia, there's no evidence it's turned up this hacker gate that, that's here in Australia. I think when you get immensely competitive for a scoop, you cut scoops turn up at random times and they and you don't and you can't make one every day my first job in tv was on the first original hinch program back in 1988 i think it was and he needed a shame 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 i lasted there about three or four months and got the hell out but so he needed a villain every night now you don't get a villain rolling up every night he's a genuine villain and so you start making villains of people who are not villains that's me out of there and I've never worked until this Negus program on now, which is 20 odd, 20 more years later, I've never worked on another commercial current affairs program uh, for that very reason. So beware of people that offer you villains or hot scoops every day. Some along the line, they're cooking the books. Uh, and just and one point about, to, sorry. We have to stop, I'm really <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay. Ah, re to I'm shut us up. I'm really sorry. I, I, I knew that lawyers were difficult to keep quiet. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is a me. new low high, depending on how you feel about it. But I am going to momentarily abuse the privilege of being in this role. And I'm going to give Ruben, who's the Director of Communications for Amnesty, a right to respond in relation to the NGO comments, particularly that Michael's been making. And he's had his hand up the whole time. Through the whole time. Yeah, wow. Forever. He was so So well Ruben Young is yeah. the Director of Communications for Amnesty. Well, good afternoon. Thanks so much for an engaging and interesting discussion. It's just been uh, fantastic. So thank you to all of you for your contributions. Uh, I represent, uh, obviously, the uh, SEVI uh, media department uh, from Amnesty International, the department with games. And... <laughs> I just wanted to have a chance to respond to a couple of comments that were made. Uh, I think in terms of uh, international coverage on human rights issues here in Australia, uh, we have come a long way uh, in generating interest, uh, largely through Al Jazeera, uh, BBC, less so with CNN, though uh, Michael, perhaps we could talk later about how we might uh, influence your former colleagues at CNN uh, to that end. Um, certainly with Chogham uh, later this month, we'll have an opportunity to influence international correspondents visiting this country. And one of our key areas of focus has got to be on international media to drive international attention, to put pressure on the Australian government in order to affect change. As we all know in this room, you know, there is a, a degree of apathy when it comes to uh, refugee issues, when it comes to indigenous issues in this country. And one way we can ensure that decision makers are paying attention is to really hone those international media and ensure that coverage appears in 
the Times, Le Monde, uh, Reuters, and so forth. Uh, and so we've made some great strides in that direction. In, in fact, uh, our media coverage across the board internationally has increased 30% year on year, something that we're very proud of and will continue to do. A couple of final observations in terms of how it is that we provide rich content to journalists such as yourselves. Uh, one point to make is that uh, Amnesty is moving more and more into the area of crowdsourcing, and that is extracting content from human rights defenders on the ground where they reside so that they can be our eyes and ears and provide us with information to support our findings and our information. So it's quite an exciting area for Amnesty International in order that we can be more responsive, and more agile, and get you, journalists, the facts you need uh, in, in real time. The second point is that uh, Sabil Shetty, who was here yesterday, uh, I think he talked a little bit about the future direction of Amnesty International. And one area that he's particularly focused on is moving researchers from London. We have 600 staff located in London moving 100 of those into the field, into the region, so that we can be more agile, more responsive, and do research with partner organizations and as Amnesty and with other human rights defenders in order to be more responsive. So a couple of observations there in terms of how we will be more agile, more responsive in the future. And again, thanks a lot for a fantastic debate this afternoon. <laughs>